One thing is certain about human nature. We're born talkers. The urge to communicate is universal. The opportunity to stay connected now almost limitless. 12 billion text messages are sent worldwide every day. But has all that web surfing, all that messaging become too much of a good thing? Are we at risk of becoming digital dummies? It's an issue for everyone. I don't think I've met a single person who says that they're happy managing the technology pace. Watching how we use our computers and cell phones is Todd Maffin's business. For some reason, we believe that we're the only ones. Everyone around us, friends and colleagues, seem busy, seem productive. So we believe that they're all doing well, and then we look at ourselves and say, gosh, I've got 200 emails in my inbox, and it's Monday morning at 8.30. I haven't even started the day. What am I doing wrong? What is it about me that is failing here? And secretly, inside all of those other people that we admire, everyone is having that feeling. Communications technology blankets the globe. There are now more than 3 billion cell phone users and 1 billion personal computer users worldwide. The number of PCs is expected to double in the next four years. Here at home, 13 million Canadians use Facebook. And we're spending more and more time surfing the net for business and pleasure. How much time do you think you spend on the internet every day? Quite a bit. Probably four hours a day. Probably eight hours a day at, at the office and at home. Maybe 12, to be honest. I usually spend three hours Facebook, blog, generally researching things. I'm not that comfortable with the amount of time I'm spending on the internet. I probably should spend a lot less. What about texting? Oh, way too much. I have a personal and a work Blackberry. That's pretty bad, I know. One of the problems with living in an always-on society is we perceive the need to always be on. It's just that because technology has come on scene, we believe that somehow, and the marketing has convinced us, that it's a better way of doing it. I'm not convinced it is. The trouble is, now we have this stuff, we're hooked on it. Can you name some places where you're texting? My car, the bathtub. In the office. <laughs> <laughs> what would happen if somebody took your phone away? I would die. How would you feel if somebody took your computer and your cell phone away? Ah, uh, no, 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 no. Yeah. That's bad. You know, the internet goes down. It's like, oh my God, what do we do? Like, I don't know how we lived without it before. Since we've been talking, this thing has vibrated four times, and I'll tell you, I'm dying to check it. Even the most powerful man in the world put up a fight and won when his security detail tried to take his BlackBerry away. Meanwhile, Her Majesty was presented with a brand new BlackBerry Bold on her recent visit to Canada. Word is, the rest of the royals already have BlackBerries, and they're heavy users. They're all hooked, just like the rest of us. These days, our laptops and those smartphones are always at our side including during the most sacred moments. And now pronounce you husband and wife. This bridegroom didn't waste any time letting the world know about an important change to his status. Oh, Dana is updating his relationship status on Facebook. <laughs> Those devices have given us the power to express ourselves, and we worship them for it. 
In London, England, the Reverend Canon David Parrott recently held a special blessing for smartphones and laptops. Parishioners raised their phones aloft as the Reverend spoke these words. May our tongues be gentle, our emails be simple, and our websites be accessible. It wasn't always this way. It's easy to forget that cell phones and personal computing have only really been around since the 1980s. Before that, computers were big machines used for things like data processing and payroll. Jack Grushkow's Vancouver company pioneered email software that helped revolutionize the industry. But he says it wasn't easy convincing the corporate world that this was going to be the next big thing. I went to one of the largest banks in the United States, to their IT department, to talk about messaging. And I got the typical kind of blank look that I got when I talked to these guys about it. Say, why would I want to send a message to Joe? I mean, if I need to get a hold of him, I stick a post-it note on his door, and he calls me on the phone. But Jack persisted and became a wealthy man. He was part of an information revolution that handed new freedoms to consumers. There is no hierarchy anymore. This flattening of communication and broadening of communication is obviously a huge social phenomenon. You can meet anybody anywhere at any time. It's incredible. All that new freedom has changed the way we live, even here. 143 years of parliamentary tradition are kept alive behind these stone walls. There's a whole lot of questions that have to be answered here. But now, technology has transformed how politicians and the press practice their crafts. So much of what they're doing at the moment... Everybody has a Blackberry. Um, we're on Blackberries pretty much all the time. And it's a total communications tool because you're an MP 24 hours a day. You might as well you know, have the tool that keeps you being an MP 24 hours a day. Justin Trudeau is the Liberal member for Montreal's Papineau Riding. His day begins with a briefing about his schedule. There's no paper here. Every MP's office is supplied with four Blackberries. They provide instant access to email, and the internet, keeping MPs in the loop as never before. You need to be as current as possible, so to employ these technologies gives you that advantage of being able to essentially get all the best information, so you're not caught really with your pants down. On Parliament Hill, knowledge truly is power. The advantage won by getting your spin on the day's stories out there first. CBC journalist Katie O'Malley is using her BlackBerry to write a post about question period for her blog. At the same time, she's receiving hundreds of messages from the government, the opposition, and her editors. Oh, I love my BlackBerry. I, be I mean... She named her dog after I named my dog BlackBerry. <laughs> it's true, she's very cute. <laughs> Now you go out for lunch, you keep the Blackberry on the desk, and there's even an etiquette that says, uh, can we just take a two-minute break mutually to read our email messages? So you're never, ever out of touch. One of the only times Katie and Susan will surrender their Blackberries is when they attend advanced briefings on budgets. There was one budget lockup where they forgot to include a smoking area, <laughs> and when I came out, I ran to the Blackberry before I ran to my cigarettes. A lot of people are beginning to ask this fundamental question. Are we in charge of our smartphones, or are they in charge of us? My wife might say I'm not, but I, I think I am. Just give me my baby, <laughs> give it to me, give it to me. It's blinking, it needs me. That might be fine for the adrenaline junkies on Parliament Hill, but in a lot of workplaces, the fierce pace of change, the relentless flow of information has taken over our lives. A group of office workers who were given smartphones were part of a Carleton University study. 
Before they got the BlackBerry, they were working about 47 hours a week. Nine months later, the average number of hours was just over 70, okay? So you see that work leaks into everything. All of the partners talked about the fact that they come in and they don't even say hi to me. They're on the thing as they walk in the door. It's beside them at the dinner table. It buzzes. Our data says it's associated with increased levels of stress, increased levels of burnout, decreased job satisfaction, decreased life satisfaction, increased marital uh, conflict. So all of those kinds of things would suggest that it's not utopia and that in fact it's got its place, but for many of us, we, we've forgotten what its place is. And introducing the BlackBerry Helmet, reinforced polymer to protect the skull of the mobile professional on the go. They've nicknamed the BlackBerry the Crackberry for a reason. Linda Duxbury says comedian Rick Mercer has a point. And a camera that broadcasts a picture of what's in front of you to your BlackBerry so you can always be looking at your BlackBerry. I think uh, it's funny, but you know what? The really sad thing is it's true. Ty Notar knows about these problems firsthand. It got so bad in her house that she wrote to the Toronto Star and the newspaper printed her story including the details about her dad's car accident. He was emailing his friends, and it wasn't even important. It was just to email them for fun. Ty had her parents sign a contract that included fines for using their smartphones during family time. They have taken over the world, or at least my dad and my mom, but the contract is starting to work for them and for the time being, my savings account. There are now 32 million BlackBerry owners worldwide. Consumers can't get enough of these smartphones. Kevin Michaluk operates CrackBerry.com. With 1.5 million followers, it is the top independent website for BlackBerry users. Core to the way they've designed the phone, they have this idea that you're going to use your smartphone 200 times a day for 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, a minute at a time. These devices are compelling and, and that's why they're selling and that's why in a time when we're in a recession and we're coming out of one, that this industry didn't suffer at all. You know, RIM sold more Blackberries than ever before, Apple sold more iPhones. And then there are the accessories. Now you can let your fingers do the talking anytime, anywhere. These devices are rewriting the rules of etiquette. Sometimes we go to, to lunch and he'll, the entire lunch, he'll be texting. And while I'm sitting there, I just feel like there's a barrier between us. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, why am I eating with you if you aren't even talking? But he's just really not that fun. So I'm actually just texting people that are a little bit more fun. People don't know that it's rude anymore because it's become the norm. And, and that's just, it's kind of sad that we become desensitized that way. It's the same story at the office. I can't stand that. People texting or checking emails or doing things in a meeting. Yeah. It's horrible. It's almost like if you're more senior, then no one cares and you can do whatever you want. We should all be on page four now, this document. Page, you'll see We're communicating, I don't care before. about you. That I'm not interested in what you say. That I'm important and you're not. And I think it's, uh, it's really damaging relationships within the workplace. When it comes to office politics, some wield their mobiles with deception in mind. We also, in our studies, we have found people who manage their image by setting their email to send the messages at three in the morning. They weren't working at three in the morning, but they wanted the image of staying up late and being dedicated. For some people, they're afraid to turn it off. They're afraid that if they don't deliver 24 and seven, it's a career limiting move. A lot of managers like smartphones because they keep employees on task, even when they're not at the office. But the experts say an always online work ethic can actually be bad for business. One of the great myths of technology is that when you buy a gadget, you know, like these things, it's supposed to give you more time. In fact, what happens is it takes time away from us in many cases because we're tinkering with it, we're setting up the, the 
themes and the skins and we're troubleshooting and things like that. So that's, that begins to stress people out in itself. Actually, it's called the productivity paradox. The more you invest in technology, actually the less productive your people are. <laughs> There's growing concern that we've become a distracted nation. That the emphasis is shifting from deep thinking to getting superficial knowledge fast. And there's worry that our brains simply can't keep up with all the modern demands for our attention. There's compelling evidence that we may only be good at doing one thing at a time. It was like something out of a movie. In New York, 15-year-old Alexa Languera made news when she fell into an open manhole. It was just really gross. It was just shocking. It was scary. It was over my head. City workers had left the sewer uncovered while they prepared the job site. Alexa was walking and texting at the time. But she blames the city crew for her injuries. Regardless if I'm texting or not, like if there was cones there, I'm going to see a big orange cone. This stupid mistake, that careless mistake, I got hurt, you know? Alexa even lost her shoe. Do you want that shoe back? No. I could just stay there. <laughs> He's on his phone. He's texting. <laughs> for a lot of people, when and where we use our technology is a personal choice, a right even if it might kill us. Jesus, chilly. <laughs> but are we all born multitaskers? Hey, what if you say, that's crazy, dude. Scientists want to find out. At Western Washington University, they've turned to a circus act for answers. Here's how the experiment works. A clown rides a unicycle around campus. Researchers watch and see which students notice. Did you notice anything unusual? And interview them about what they remember seeing on their walk to and from class. You were there all the time. Sixty percent of the students who were listening to music saw the clown. And pairs of people do great. 70% of them, over 70% of them, see the unicycling clown. But students using cell phones, well, that was a different story. Only 25% of them saw the unicycling clown. Uh, so they, they really were oblivious to the surroundings. It's what we refer to as inattentional blindness. What's worse, the cell phone users who missed seeing the clown believed that they were aware of everything that was going on around them. Researchers say that delusion can be dangerous. People think when they're driving with their cell phone or walking with their cell phone that they're aware of the stuff around them, but they're missing all sorts of stuff and they don't, they don't even realize what they're missing until it's, until it's probably too late. At the Virginia Technical Institute, they're attempting to settle an argument that's been going on everywhere. They're testing our ability to multitask while we're driving. For many truck drivers, the cab has become a mobile office. On Virginia Tech's closed track, this driver will attempt to send a text while at the wheel. Cameras will record his driving performance. This research shows that on average, texters look away from the road for 4.6 seconds. Watch as this driver wanders toward the shoulder. Going around 50 to 60 miles an hour traveling at those speeds while looking away for that long, you could travel the length of a football field without actually looking at the forward roadway, which is extremely dangerous. It's been estimated that at any given time, 10% of drivers on the road are using their cell phones. If they're texting, they're up to 23 times more likely to be in an accident. Here, cameras record a bus driver texting while driving on the freeway. His handicapped passengers have no idea they're in grave danger.
Luckily, no one was seriously injured. Collisions like this make headlines and fuel the debate over whether driving and dialing should be banned. They also clearly reveal the limits of our multitasking abilities. You know, our brain is really only capable of single tasking, working on one thing at a time. And some people will say, well, I multitask all the time. I do it so my brain's capable. That's not really what's happening. In fact, what you're doing is task switching at a very quick rate. Dr. Gary Small is a neuroscientist at the University of California, Los Angeles, and a leading expert on how technology affects the brain. We can deal with that later. The studies have found that a middle-aged person who multitasks makes more errors. Who told you that? That's indisputable. Even in young people, with all the multitasking, there's a tendency to do things faster there's a perception that we're getting more done, but we're actually sloppier. The scientists say, when we're doing this, we're paying partial continuous attention to many tasks. It's stressful, and stress can actually shrink the brain and contribute to memory loss. In a sense, what's happening in the brain when we're interrupted, we have to shut down one program and shift to another. A lot of work time is lost because we have to shift tasks. And I think it's important for people to be aware of their multitasking, try to limit it so they'll be more efficient, truly more efficient, not just perceiving that they're more efficient. Still thinking you're a great multitasker? Try this awareness test. Count the number of passes the white team makes. The answer is 13. But did you notice the witch walking through the practice? Research is showing that those who multitask a lot with technology are more easily distracted and actually have more problems remembering and juggling tasks than those who don't. We're maybe working on the computer, but we're waiting for another buzz or ping or something that might be slightly more interesting. And so our brains are kind of on alert, waiting for new information to come in from the environment. Your cell phone ringing, the ads on your laptop, and everything on the internet is, is so attractive. And what's happening is that they're destroying the central resource, which is our ability to focus. All these media are just aggressively suiting our attention, and there's just no attention left. Despite all the evidence, a lot of people still just don't take this kind of behavior seriously. How many accidents have you had that relate to your phone? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> How many? You can see it on the popular TV show, Canada's Worst Driver. Huh? She texts, she emails, and she constantly calls. Hello, hello, hello. I think I'm addicted to my phone. I do. And it's not just dialing and driving. In October 2009, on a flight from San Diego to Minneapolis, two Northwest Airline pilots overshot the airport by 240 kilometers. They were on their laptops scheduling their hours as the plane flew past its destination. Passengers and the airline were not impressed. The pilots were suspended. But it could have been much worse. We had a collision with something. We have a whole bunch of people who are now bleeding and our the car is almost virtually destroyed. It was real bad. In September 2008, a commuter train collided with a freight train near Los Angeles, California. 25 people were killed and 135 were injured. 
The train driver, 46-year-old Robert Sanchez, missed a signal to stop on a siding to let the freight train pass. Sanchez died in the crash. An investigation revealed that he often sent and received text messages while on the job. The last one was 22 seconds before the collision. The experts say some people just can't sign off. Linda Duxbury has encountered many of them. I say, you're addicted, turn it off. And they go, oh, no, 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 I'm not addicted. I could turn it off any time. I go, well, then turn it off. And they go, well, I could, any time, but just not now. In Fall City, Washington, just a few kilometers from Microsoft headquarters, they come to get treatment for their internet addiction. The Restart Internet Addiction Recovery Program has attracted international attention. Hillary Cash and Cosette Ray are counselors. A big component of it is, is just the absence away from technology to allow the person to have some clarity of thought, to be able to focus in on what's going on the here and now. Adult clients move in. The cost? Up to $27,000 for a 90-day stay. This woman says it was worth every cent, claiming that her son was saved by the center. That was a terrible time in my life. It was just uh, incredibly stressful. Uh, to see your child suffer like that and to know, not know how to help them is just beyond words, really. She watched her bright and capable son's life unravel as he spent more and more time playing interactive games on the Internet. It was bad enough that he lost his job at one point. He was functioning less and less and seemed to be playing more and more. And that seemed to be his only existence and his only time when he seemed happy, even. Surprisingly, internet addiction is not a recognized medical affliction. But Hillary Cash says it should be. Anywhere from uh, 6 to 10 percent of the population that's online meets criteria for internet addiction. We were contacted by a stepmom who was very worried because her stepson, who did not live with her, had just had his leg amputated. And he had had his leg amputated because of thrombosis, which he developed from inactivity, just sitting day after day after day in front of his computer. They're spending hours and hours using the technology. When they're not using the technology, they crave it. It's interfering with their everyday lives. They're secretive about it. It really fits in with that addictive behavior pattern. Crackberry.com provides a 12-step program for those who are ready to admit to having a BlackBerry problem. Kevin Michaluk has also co-authored this book. He admits he's hooked too. Because of what I do, I have a lot of excuses that I can help justify my BlackBerry use. But definitely, I mean, when I try to, to not use the device, it, it calls out to me and, and I reach for it for sure. Crackberry.com also has a quiz to help you determine whether you're addicted. Here are some of the warning signs. Test yourself. Do you ever sneak away from people or groups to use your BlackBerry? Have you ever checked your BlackBerry while at a meal with others? Do you use your BlackBerry in the bathroom and wish you could use it in the shower? Do you feel lost or naked if you don't have your BlackBerry with you? If you answered yes to all of them, according to Kevin, you may have a problem. The more we're connected to technology and information overload, the more you start to live virtually. But there's a risk with that, in that you might be virtually living. When we come back, they're the always-on generation. But when was the last time they read a book? 
And can they carry on a conversation? In this sociology class at the University of Toronto, laptops are the tool of choice for taking notes. And if you miss something, no problem. You can listen to it all again on your digital audio recorder or download the prof's notes. But it's in the bars and dance clubs where you really notice the generational divide. It has to do with younger generations being able to process and assimilate information quicker than the older generations. One of the ways that we see that is, is through music and how we listen to music. Yale Fox is one of Toronto's hottest DJs. His specialty? Mashups. Dance music that mixes and blends together short sections of many songs. Yale also has a degree in sociology. He's partnered with University of Toronto professor Bob Brim on research into something they call music attention deficit disorder. They say how Yale's generation listens to dance music reflects how technology has shortened their attention span. Bob Brim says that's also playing out in his lecture theater. People who are less well prepared and who've been perhaps more exposed to various media are less able to concentrate and they can only take things in small chunks. A lot of the professors are having trouble getting the students to stop texting during class. One professor told me that she gives the kids a five minute texting break halfway through the class. So something's going on that they can't be without it for even an hour at a time. We don't have to plan out our week. We don't have to plan out our day. We get it within 10 minutes, and then we're at the We're bar. students. We're busy. We want to hear about the best party and the fastest way we can get there. That's right. That's just the new the way. Nation, That's the new way. Right? That's just how Blackberry it is. Nation. But some researchers say the Blackberry Nation has a problem. They're raising the alarm claiming that young people are just snacking on the superficial knowledge they find in cyberspace. I tell students in class all the time, you guys are lazy and ignorant. And don't tell me how busy you are. You're always talking about how busy you are. You watch two hours and 41 minutes of TV a day. 55% of high school students spend less than one hour a week reading and studying for class. They spend nine hours a week social networking. There's worry that internet use is contributing to a decline in reading skills, and that we're all wading in the intellectual shallows. We're moving to something that puts all the stress on just finding information. We're losing that focus on deep thinking, deep, steady thinking about one thing. I think we become less interesting as people, as individuals, if all we're doing is gathering information and quickly uh, moving around the web, and I... Some argue that it maybe inhibits creative thinking. Uh, whenever you have a new idea, instead of pursuing it, your colleagues will vet it immediately and they'll say, oh, that's a stupid idea, don't pursue that, and we may be less creative. So what is happening to the new generation growing up in an ever-expanding digital world? Chris Rowan is an occupational therapist in Seychelles, British Columbia, and a specialist on how technology use affects younger children. What I started noticing was a lot of the kids that I was working with had high technology usage, and they had huge difficulty paying attention. Chris Rowan says wired kids' problems usually begin at home where families are more connected to technology than each other. There's a huge disconnection uh, between uh, partners, between parents and children, uh, between siblings. I'm seeing more and more families feeling very uncomfortable in social situations with each other. So how much screen time is too much for our kids? Pediatricians recommend that children under the age of two be kept away from the television, the computer, and video games. Children older than two? No more than two hours a day, and no longer than 20 minutes at a time. Young people today are spending a tremendous amount of time with their technology. 
Now, what's going to happen to that young developing brain? It's going to be very strong with the technology skills. But what about the human contact skills? Looking at someone in the eye when you have a conversation or noticing nonverbal cues during that conversation. All that technology use may even be rewiring our brains. We know that if the brain spends a lot of time in a particular mental task over and over again, it will be strengthened. The neural circuits controlling that task will be very strong. On the other hand, if we avoid certain tasks, the neural circuits controlling those tasks will be very weak. And that basic principle is a concern. In the end, there is no putting the digital genie back in the bottle. The flow of information through our lives is only going to increase as new and faster devices become available. Still, even those in the so-called I generation sometimes lament what's being left behind. I think, you know, people have forgotten about the, you know, the important craft of being able to write a letter or actually write with a pen. It's kind of like, I feel a bit like a secretary in the past, like, you know, you sit through and you just type away. If you were raised with a mouse in your hands, this is a chance to experience some things forgotten in the age of instant messaging. So she told me when it gets stuck to just shake it a little. A return to a time when writing began with careful thinking. First thing that comes into your head, you type, and you have to believe what you're saying is the truth, because you can't erase it. This store in Vancouver is called the Regional Assembly of Text. Admission to this stationary retailer's monthly letter writing club? Absolutely free. It's a big hit. Usually we open the doors at 7 and there's people waiting to come in. But these typists aren't about to replace their cell phones and computers with a Smith Corona. They're just here to socialize and enjoy the sound and the fury of the office their grandparents knew. I like that it's loud and offensive. You know? I like that it's very artful and soulful. But some are looking for relief from the always changing, always on digital world they've inherited. My friends and I talk a lot about um, working with information, working with knowledge, and not working with um, an output that we can see or that we can feel, and how stressful that can become for, for our generation. Uh, not being able to end the day feeling like we can look at what we've created. And so I think that in that way we're losing a lot. All that conflict over technology use has left a lot of us looking for answers. The simple solution is just to turn off and tune out. But is that possible? A lot of people dream about stepping off the grid, escaping from the relentless demands of life in the information age. Lauren Berman has been living that dream on the BC coast. At the end of the day, when he closes up his dental practice in town, Lorne returns to his version of paradise, where the clamor of the outside world is kept at a safe distance. I haven't had a television since I was a kid, and I can't imagine where I'd fit one into my life or what I'd have to cut out of my life to find room for one or why I'd want to. And the computer, I thought I would feel the same. But these days, digital technology seems to worm itself into every corner of our lives, even here. When one of his daughters told him she needed a computer for her schoolwork, he reluctantly agreed. And then Lauren made a surprising discovery for himself. I was astonished to be able to be living in such a rustic environment, seemingly disconnected from the rest of the world around me at least the illusion of, of that disconnection. And there I was, connected somehow to an art gallery in Russia. Lauren Berman's conversion to a digital believer says a lot about our relationship with technology. 
it's become our main street and our town hall. If you want to be included, you have to be connected. I was a holdout on the cell phone too. I just didn't seem to really need it, but how many U-turns can you make to find a pay phone and find that it's out of order and or there's somebody using it or you can't find a pay phone? Anyway, I now have a cell phone and I admit that when I leave the house, I'm making sure it's in my pocket and if it's not, I'm wondering where I've left it. Email pioneer Jack Grushkow says, those who think computers and the internet are evil are wrong. It's a tool. Is a hammer good? It's good if you build a house with it. It's bad if you hit somebody over the head with it. It's a cop out to call it good or evil. It's each individual making a decision for themselves. Our choice is to use them wisely or use them poorly. That means taking a hard look at when, where, and how often we are connected and finding the will to simply turn it off. It's critical. We will either manage the technology around us or it will manage us. And if it's the latter, if it manages us, we are doomed to anxiety and stress. We need to leave time for play. We need to leave time for our brain to just unwind. It just has to be time away from the machine of information. and Our lives do get better. They do. Thank you.